We thank you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn in them to the book of 1 John as we continue uh, our, uh, our series that we've entitled Life Lessons for John. They're not necessarily lessons about aspects of life. It's just lessons about life itself, the concept of life. Uh, and so we've been looking at things from the very beginning that John talks about the difference between light and dark, living life the right way or living life the wrong way. The right way to do life, he says, always starts in Christ, understanding who he is and understanding that in, in Jesus Christ, this picture of who God is, what God is like, that God is good, he's the essence of good, he's all loving, that everything he does is from this concept of, of love, his, from, from the, the essence of, of love, which is good. Everything he does comes good. And, and it creates kind of a, a, a paradox at times in us. That how can a good God, if he's all loving and all good, then how do terrible things happen in this world? And so some of that, you have to understand the difference between God as a God that is in control, but a God that still gives consent, or the God that is all loving, but yet still gives man free will. And so all of that comes, and, and, and John is, is saying, look, for us, we have to understand that there are certain things that we can do, and if we want life to be a, a wonderful experience, an enjoyable experience, then there is a right way to do that. And the right way to do that is by always moving towards the light, is more of moving towards the goodness of God, moving in a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. He then goes that part of that, as we continued our series, has to do with then the difference between truth and a lie. Uh, there are things that are true, that are absolutely true, and there are things that are, are not true. They are the things of the, the kingdom of darkness or the dominion of that or the rule of the kingdom of darkness that is always exemplified in our world, in the world system and how it operates. And we talked a lot about that. He then moved on to say, then, you've got to be sure that you are loving God but not the world system, that you are, are, are being transformed and you are forming and being conformed into the very kingdom of light, God's kingdom, that you are allowing God's spirit to change you as opposed to allowing your culture to change you. So he says, don't love the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, 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 the boastful pride. Don't fall into that. He said, we want, we want to make sure that, that you can tell the love of the Father, that if you are, are a, a Christian, a believer, a follower of Christ, then you're going to love over here. These are going to be your priorities. Loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. It's going to be something that is so important to you. That's, that's what motivates you. That's what you're conforming to. That's what's changing you. That's what your thoughts are upon. And, and then to turn that and then to be servants by loving other people. He said, that is really the true test. Moms do that on a regular basis, right? Moms are always constantly, constantly giving, constantly serving. I'm always amazed at this aspect that maybe moms have a little bit different than maybe dads, and that is that sense of unconditional love, that they can be screaming at a kid and then hugging. I don't have that. I don't make that quick switch. <laughs> when I'm yelling and screaming, there's a reason for it, and I want there to be some kind of infliction of pain as a result of it, <laughs> which is not probably the, the best way. Um, and, and so I, I'm, God is, is one, and John wants us to know that God has this ability to always embrace, to always pull in, to always be in a place of, of giving forgiveness, 
know, we talked about the parable of the, uh, of the prodigal son, and, and that's that picture of, of the father always looking, always embracing when someone returns. One who was loving the world, discovered what that brings, and returns. And, and how that picture, how Jesus gives that picture to us. Well, this morning, we're going to continue, and, and we're, we're going to be really looking at um, just this, this issue of um, how then our attention on Christ and on the kingdom of light, what, how that changes and, and what do we need to be aware of uh, on, on a regular, everyday basis? And, and it's an intriguing thing because um, no matter what culture has ever existed, ancient, modern, there is something in every culture of the world where it, it appears that God has imprinted on, on the heart of man the story of creation and of tragedy and of reclamation and of transformation. That the story of creation and rescue and change seems to be everywhere, and you see it. Even dating, you know, back into ancient stories, um, you, you see it in, in almost every religion of the world. Uh, you see it in, in our culture today. Disney has made a, a, a billion-dollar industry out of it. You see Disney grabs movies like and, and creates movies like uh, Mary Poppins of this woman who comes in and, and is rescuing a family, and as a result, they're forever changed. You see that in, in the... Um, the kind of animated ones, the Beauty and the Beast, you know, the, the Lion King. There's always these stories of, of rescue as a result of something that went, uh, that, that went really, really bad. And then there's a change as a result of it. And so that whole realm is, is always happening. And, and John would attribute that to the fact that we have a, cre- a creator, creator God that puts on flesh and blood, and he comes to rescue, comes to save us. And as a result of that, we are changed. And that's the kingdom that we want to put our attention to. That's the God that we want to love with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. That's the change in loving our neighbor as ourself that we want to be engaged in. That's the radical aspect of turning the other cheek, going a second mile, giving something when we've been ripped off in addition to that, forgiving. All of the, the, the aspects that seem so counter-culture or counter-kingdom to this world are the things that John is, is gauging. So this morning, we're going to walk through the passage a little bit, pull out the main point, talk a little bit about God's love and then send our moms home to make sure that we beat everybody else to the restaurants and all of that. So here we go. If you have your Bibles, we are in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. He writes, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. As we read through this, you're going to be astounded at how many times he uses words like us, we, you, speaking of the the personal aspect of this. He says, For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself or herself just as he is pure. And then the tough portion comes. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. 
But the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him or her, and he or she cannot sin because they are born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteous, righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. We'll stop there because that gets really depressing. <laughs> the whole aspect of this, everything that he's talking about, is this is God, this is what God has done, and there are two types of people. There are people who are going to embrace it. We'll call them the insiders. And there are people who are not going to embrace it. We'll call them the outsiders. Or the ones who embrace it are the children of the kingdom of Christ, of God. The ones who refuse to accept it are those who live in the kingdom of this world of darkness. They are having a dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer experience of light. It's always getting at. So those who live over here on the inside, their issue is to choose to do what's right. And when they do, they discover that life has a more full aspect. These over here do life on their own terms, and so their life could potentially be full, or it could potentially be not full. But we know this, that when it ends, on this side, fullness is all extracted. And all you have is an eternity apart from the, the eternal, perfect aspect of full, abundant life, light. So you, you kind of continue in that. So let's walk through this a little bit. And... The first thing that, that John wants us to know is this. Look, when you come to Christ, two things happen. You are both forgiven, which is a great thing to be forgiven, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's nothing worse in life than walking in a, a state of, of guilt, isn't it? I hate the feel, feeling of guilty. But even worse than that, what comes with guilt is that sense if, if you have to carry it, guilt never stays guilt. It becomes shame. And shame starts to erode and extract from you the feelings, the emotions, the reality that you are in fact worthwhile, that you are good, that you have good in you. You walk around with shame and you just kind of feel like you need to hide, that, that there's a sense where a, a facade needs to be put up around you. That's where our world lives constantly. Our world has varying degrees of faith, doesn't it? It's the, it's the great shell game, the great Ponzi scheme, the great con. You, you, you're, you're handed something that appears to be good. The American dream appears to be good until you discover as you're walking through the dream and you're chasing all these things that you get to a point of going, I feel like George Jetson on that like stupid thing that I'm walking outside and I'm never catching Astro. He won't stop, you know, or the carrot. I never seem to get it, you know, and then all of a sudden you look back and you discover that life has gotten away from you. I remember I, I was at um, a graduation yesterday, um, ironically for, for my nephew, and I didn't realize that, that Janine Duda was also graduating. Congratulations. And um, I was thinking about that because every time you kind of sit in in, in graduations, it kind of brings me back to, to my own. And I remember, and I don't know if they still do this, but it, at the beginning of your senior year, they always ask you for a quote that goes next to your picture. And uh, back, in the, back in the 70s when I graduated, there was a group um, that was a lot bigger than they are now. Many of you may have heard, everybody that's 50 or, or older will like go, wow, he was a, really? It was a group called Pink Floyd. And I was, I'm an eclectic guy. Um, and so my quote came from a song. And the, the quote of the song says, if I can remember it right now, that um, you wake up one day 
and you discover that 10 years have gone behind you. No one told you to run, you missed the starting gun. I think a lot about that, that the American dream constantly gets us running after things. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're 58 years old. And you're watching nephews that you saw running around as a little kid that seemed like it was yesterday. You ever notice the older you get, memories seem like they were just yesterday? What John wants us to understand here is one of the great things about coming to Christ is that you're forgiven of all of this, of this sin imprint on your soul. But equally great with that is you don't have to remain the same that it changes you forever. If you'll give your life over and submit and surrender to the dominion of this kingdom, which is of Christ, to his rule, you're constantly changing. That change is coming, we know, from the inside out. And so John makes it very, very aware that he says, look, verse 1, see how great a love of the Father has bestowed on us. It's great love that we would be called children of God, that all of a sudden now you are in the family or you're inside the family, you are a child of God. You're a son, you're a daughter of God. That's a phenomenal thing that should now create in us a drive to know as much about our family history as possible. But equally dangerous is when we get pulled over here to learn as much as we can about life in this world. And so he's saying that our priority needs to be here. The world needs to be secondary. So this whole change is uh, is important. And that it's so personal that we read through the, 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 the personal pronouns, we, us. That's who we are as people, as believers that God's love has been so poured out on us, in us, and through us. That's why Jesus, when he was asked, sums up everything in this word, love. Greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all of who you are, with the entirety of the person, so that the image of God the real image of God can be seen by other people when you involve them. I do not believe that the pure image of God can be seen unless you're in Christ. That's the re-imaging that the Holy Spirit is doing. And that's what John is saying here. So he goes on then to say, uh, this means then, this love of God, something that we all know, that we are no longer at odds with God. We're not enemies is the term the the Bible uses, but I would say probably at odds with God because of the curse of sin. So all of that changes to some degree, right? Because God's love has changed everything, including death, including the fact that we are enemies with him. It changes all of our relationship with him, and then it changes everything with how we relate to everybody else, provided, again, that that's our priority. And it usually is for those on the inside. A couple verses I have, or or portions of of text that I have written down, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 5, Colossians 1, 12 through, through 15, we discover the same theme being said again. He does what? He rescues us from darkness. He um, transfers us to the kingdom of light, Paul says to the church at Colossae. In Ephesians, we were dead in our sins, per se, uh, which we formerly walked in means, again, there was a point in time where this world was so important to us that we we just kind of did things naturally. Do you ever notice when you come to Christ, things that you did without ever thinking about, all of a sudden now you're thinking, going, I can't believe I used to do that. You know, we were, we're, I was just talking with, with Jeff McInish before the service, and he, you know, we we're talking about how quickly my daughter has grown up, 
and you know she's gone from zero to whatever age she is now, I would tell you, but then I get yelled at. Um, but she did have a birthday, and it's no longer a two. And so, um, do the math, do the math. I'm not revealing any secrets. And I, and I said, you know, it's funny because you, you look at, at that and how a person changes, but then you look at how you have changed in that. And we were talking about what it was like when we, him and I were younger. And the things that we used to do that you would go, I can't even believe I did that. I can't believe I thought like that. I can't even believe that I was involved in that. And I used to do that stuff, you know, most of us, without even thinking. You know, let your imagination go wild. Um, because we've all, we've all been there, uh, some of us. And, and he said, those are all the things you formerly or used to walk in. But now... Those desires of the flesh that were predominant are no longer your priority. Why? Because of grace. For it's grace that you have been saved. And this, not of your own, it's a gift from God. This God who creates the world, who creates the narrative, cares enough to involve us and somehow share with us the narrative. So if you can find the narrative, you can get the story, every part of this fits the grand scheme, fits the narrative. And you understand a little bit more each and every day. You understand your family history, your family lineage, you understand your family values, your family seal. You have all of it, you start to see. And John is, is pushing us in that way, saying, look, it's, it's great to be forgiven. It's great to be changed. But all of this is because this thing called the curse of sin, it's been broken. It doesn't apply to you on the inside anymore. Everything is now different. So... That's a great thing. He says, now, the problem, though, is those on the outside. Those on the outside, well, they're not going to either understand it always, nor will they really celebrate it in their life. Think about this. Do you ever remember when you when you, you made that decision to, to switch allegiances, you crossed over the line, you gave your life to Christ, and you went and told people about it that were close in your life? I remember being shocked that people weren't excited. And not only were that, was, was I shocked but that they weren't that excited, but that they were very condescending. Like I became like an idiot overnight. Oh, that's so good for you. And these were people that, I, I knew very close. Some were family, relatives, a lot of people that were, um, heck, my best man in my wedding was like that. It was like, oh, my gosh. And, 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 and you're kind of like, I don't, I don't quite understand it. I shared with, you know, other teachers, administrators, and, and they just didn't see, and it's kind of like, well, that's really good for you, you know, and, and everybody has to, you know, do what's right for that. And I'm like, eh, Really? And it was kind of surprised that they neither really, really got it. And, and so that's really, look at verses 2 and 3, because that's really what John here is, is getting at. He's saying, look, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So I think people kind of in the beginning look and go, yeah, I, I've really known you. We'll see how this really plays out. And... We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope will purify themselves. So not everybody is going to have this hope. Not everybody is going to get this. Not everybody is going to want this. Not everybody is going to celebrate. Not everybody's going to jump up and down and go, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. Sure, I'm going to hand over control of my life, of my finances, of my future, of everything 
to a God that I neither really know, can see, can touch, can hear, can speak, all of that. I don't know if I'm really up for that, especially when I live in a culture that says, you know what, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and if you can see it, uh, you can be it, and, and everybody's, you know, all the buzzwords that our culture has. They're not always going to get that, and they're not always going to celebrate it. And he says then for us, the point of all of this then for those of us who do, those who us are on the inside, the best then is yet to come. Because we don't always know what this is going to look like. All we know is that when he appears, we're going to be like him. So there's some kind of change that is going to be a finality of change that we're all undergoing on a regular basis. But I don't really know what that is. And many times he's getting at this that there are times in this, that you have to remind yourself the best is out there, the best isn't necessarily here. And so you need to keep working towards that. And so the, the part of this then that he gets at is, is that what's so amazing is this includes both the spiritual change, realizing we all know that there's something really good in eternity, right? And spiritually, we're all going to experience that, and there's going to be no sin, no sickness, no death, no disease, no poverty, no um, Nobody you hate. I, I don't know. You can, whatever your mind wraps around with the best, that's going to be there. And, and that's out there in this really cool kind of kingdom that is going to be built here on earth. And Jesus is going to reign and, and we're going to be a part of it. And we're going to have a place in it. And, and we're not going to get picked on if we were picked on. And, and we're going to finally be a somebody if we were a nobody. And all the things that you like really go. That's kind of the, the, the spiritual change. But we forget that there's a lot of physical change that there's a lot of emotional change that goes with this as well. And that's really what he is getting at here. And that's why he says that everybody who has this hope spiritually will purify themselves physically, emotionally, that they will actually put this into work. It's kind of like this. Um, Everybody knows that if they, want to, if they want to lose weight, there's a thing called a diet that you can do, right? It involves eating less, eating healthier, working out more, all of that, right? We, so the best life would be, in our culture, would be, you know, if you were to shed a few pounds. That's a really cool thing. So the purifying part of that would be my involvement I've always said this, the best day to diet is the day you declare your diet. After that, it's no longer fun. (laughs) The best day to get in shape is the day that you say, today is the day I'm hitting the gym. That's the only day it's a good day. Because the purifying thing means it becomes the mundane everyday process of the doing and doing and doing. It's the my part of all of this. And it's the reason why athletes train. I mean, even just coming off the the NFL draft, a lot of guys slip in the draft after their pro day or after the, 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 the... the day that all the athletes show up and get all their testing, their, their 40 times, their vertical times, their, their cone drills, their, you know, their uh, long jump, all of that, the number of reps they can do at 235, all of those things that they do. Some of the guys that really go further are the guys that have trained knowing that if I do this, I can parlay this into a higher pick, higher money, higher up, a better opportunity. Some guys actually fall and fail because they sit there and go, you know what, I know I'm going to get drafted, no big deal, and they show up and they don't perform as much because they didn't do the work. And that's at the professional level. The high school, college level happens all the time. Guys don't work out, girls don't work out, and and they, they're sitting there going, yeah, the season will get there and everything's going to be fine. You get to the season and then all of a sudden they're not playing as much as they wanted to and they start to whine and they start to complain and then their parents start to complain. Why? Because I'm not getting what I wanted, but you didn't put the work in. Sometimes in the Christian circles, we do the same thing. 
We do it in our marriages. We do it in our relationships. We do it in our parenting, all of that, because we don't want to do the purifying thing. We think purifying is something that God does for us automatically. And we pray. Remember this. God will never do for you what you are required to do for him. He will save you. He will sanctify you. But everything else, that's on you. There are some things that we must do. And there are constantly principles of the if-then kind of aspect because God, yes, is in control of everything, but God also gives his consent to say, I'll let this play out. Why? Because of the narrative he's put in place. It's a really, really cool, cool story. So let's look now at the hard part, the depressing part, and then I'm going to get you out of here. My job is to turn the depressing part into the really good part. So verses 4 through 10. This has to do really with the biggest differences between the insider and the outsider. So everybody here that um, has purified themselves, understood that they have the forgiveness of Christ, this really, we're going to say this really doesn't necessarily apply to you. So we'll read through it again. And then we'll kind of break it apart. Everyone who practices sin, verse 4, also practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Sin means I've missed the mark, right? That's what sin means. Lawlessness means you broke the law. You didn't match the law. It wasn't perfect. So in our um, vernacular, if you're supposed to park 30 feet from a stop sign and you park 10 feet, you got a ticket and you went, look, I didn't park on front of the... You missed the mark, didn't you? That's kind of the same kind of thing. God has some some laws, some standards that we are to meet. He says those who don't meet it, they, are, they have sin. Sin is lawlessness. Uh, he says, you know, you all, that he appeared in order to take away sins. That's the whole purpose. Jesus Christ comes to remove the, the standard of sin that's imprinted on our soul, original sin, the order in which we have been born in. He comes to say, I'm going to live sinless so that in me, you can actually sin less in your life as a result of this relationship by what you are giving your love to. He says, no one in verse six who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. That's a scary verse. Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. Uh, The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, was to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because the seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not abide in the Father. All right, let's walk through this because you go, oh my gosh, I'm sin, I'm sin, I'm sin, I'm sin, I'm sin. He says that, look, this is how you tell the, the insiders from the outsiders. The outsiders, and I use that term because it was one of my favorite books when I was a kid reading. S.E. Hinton wrote a book. It was really kind of a cool one. But it was the people that are outside. They're not on in. They're not the in group. They're not. These would be those who that... Um, well, very simply, the outsider is the ones who continue to miss the mark. They continue to sin. That would be this. It's the individual who refuses to surrender control of their life. That's what this is all about. Are you taking control of your life or are you giving control of your life to God in Christ? ones who make their own calls, they remain unchanged. They're in this world, they're of the world, they embrace the world, they participate, they practice the values, the mores, all of this world culturally, and wherever they live, is what they embrace and become like. They imitate, they become the image of it. They reflect it into their world. Um... It's to these that the dimness of God's light, that when you do this, it's almost like um, if you had a a light switch at home that has a dimmer on it, and you slide the dimmer or turn it, you can take the point down further and further in light. 
what, what he's saying here is that there are people that when you don't want to follow, when you don't want to, when you don't want to live in God's kingdom by following his standards of loving him and loving others, the light gets turned down. And it, it's not that it goes out. He just dims it. So all of us have walked at times in dim light. It's when we start doing things according to his standards that the dimmer switch goes the other way and light starts to come back into your life. But he says the people on the outside, they don't seem to want to do that. They, they, want, to, they want to embrace that. It was the, if you remember from our series on Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul was talking about this very thing in culture and world and in time. Um, the people that are there then that love the world would be those who will ultimately excuse their sin. They'll make excuses. They'll create psychological disorders, as we've said before. And so not only do they then excuse it, but then they'll rationalize it as well. When you excuse it and rationalize it, pretty soon you will embrace it and the behavior will just become ingrained. And we see it all the time in our culture. It's it's part of even in, in a lot of 12 steps. They try to break all of that. They try to break the excuse, the rationalization, the repetition. Because the cycle will become so ingrained in you that light literally goes so, so dim that you can't even tell anymore. And so he says, if, if you will walk away and repent of that, then you will be right. You'll live the right way. You'll seek the right way just as he is right and you understand it and you see life from a completely different perspective. That's why the two kingdoms constantly are at odds. You you constantly look at it and you go, how do you think like that? And they stand there and go, how in the world do you think like that? Because the way that we view the outsider as completely lost and, and crazy and wrong is the way they view us. I mean, I, I remember the, um, the little picture of, the, uh, of a bumper sticker, sticker in Chicago during the election. Will the Christians please hurry up and be raptured so we can have this world to ourselves? Oh, that was kind of interesting. I'm going, That's a pretty interesting perspective. You know, the Christians are going, can we please hurry up and have the rapture? You can have the world to yourself. As if God's going to just like, I mean, this is for another series. I don't even going to go there. Because it's Mother's Day, and I promised our staff I would get everybody out of here. All right. Now, insiders, on the other hand, have two things that we have to understand. We have both the desire and the power to resist sin, which is lawlessness, missing the mark, repetition, rationalization, excusing of sin. We have that. That that is what is working inside of us as we are inside of of the family of God. Okay, one of these God will give, the other he will not give. This is what we come up with. So, um, the understanding by John is pretty simple. If you love God, you will naturally sin less. You will notice a decrease in the amount of sinning that you do in your life. In all of us, even though if you are a guilt-ridden, negative type of person, glass half empty type person, or like to like beat yourself up type person, you have to admit that from where you were before Christ to where you are, you're sinning less. Even if it's like one less a day, you're sinning less. So, you know, applaud yourself and go, okay, I'm not in this part right here. Um, ultimately, when you come to Christ, you will live differently, or you're supposed to live differently. So what God will do is he will give you the power necessary to live this life. That's what comes with the Holy Spirit coming in you. There's a power that's working. That's a power that's changing all of that. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 uh, makes that very statement, that, that we have both the, um, 
the, the power and the will, he says, to act. We're told to what? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who wills, desires, in you to work out. It's kind of like, um, oh, what would be a good word? Oh, I used to, when in college, I used to work at a pizza shop that actually did real dough pizza. Why in the world we would make real dough for college kids who couldn't appreciate it anyway or even understand it was real or fake, I have no idea. But we would have, <laughs> we would have these um, little balls of dough that came and you take them out of the refrigerator and you would put it in a pan or if you got really good, you could like pull it and spin it and all of that. And I would do, that was one of the things I would do and it would fall on the floor. And it's for college kids, so I'd pick it up and it's not a big deal. <laughs> and so you, but you would, you would have to kind of knead it to make it fit the pan. That's what salvation is for us. We knead it out. We push, it's pulling. It's, it, we would rather us remain a lump of dough, but this is what God is doing in us, okay? He's kind of, it's, he's the power to do this and, and, and to, to move it to change. And so, um, however, in order to look like the pizza, there are some things that you have to add to it. It's the adding part that most of us don't like because the adding part is the, actually the purifying part. You're adding by subtracting. You're putting things into your life. And the best place to, to, to discover that is in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-9. through 9. He talks about all these things we are to add. And there's a whole list. To this, you add this. To goodness, add perseverance. To perseverance, you add self-control. You're adding. We're always adding all these things. You ever notice that... When you're impatient, adding patience is a rotten thing to add to your life. When you're not a person who likes to endure and you're a person who likes to quit, persevering is not a fun thing. When you are a spendaholic, stop spending is not a fun thing in your life. When you need to die, die is not a fun thing in your life. When you need to work out, working out is not a fun thing in your life. Anybody who tells you is lying or they're trying to sell a book. So all of these things is the addition that we have to put into. See, this is what our moms really get. Because the adding equals a habit. I can't tell you how many times since we've had kids that I have heard my wife say, brush your teeth, put deodorant on. Did you make your bed? Did you pick the clothes up off the floor? Did you bathe? I mean, all those crazy things. Did you do your homework? You know, or go do this, go do... She's establishing habits in their life. I'm the enforcer of the habit. I can sit on the couch and go, look, either you go put the odor on or I'm going to smack you in your head. And so it's just easier for you to go do that. But, she, but the, the, the habit-forming aspect is what Peter is saying that we do. The inside those who are loving God, who are desiring to love their neighbor, are always adding. That's the purifying. That's the desire that God will not do. If you choose not to persevere, he's going to let you not persevere. If you choose to be a person who goes off and yells and has no self-control, he's not going to force you to do that. He's given you the power to do it just like in our realm, going to a gym is always easier when you go with somebody else, when you diet to do it with somebody else. That's why the church is to be together because this adding part requires accountability to have somebody there who's encouraging you to do it. It's what makes marriage kind of cool. It's what makes friendship kind of cool. It's make what any kind of relationship really a cool thing because you're always there to help someone, but if you can't try to do this by yourself, many times you quit, you give up. And that's what John is saying here. And so God will give us the power and he will assist us in the desire if we will let him. He'll show us what we're supposed to do 
And once we start doing it, the power hits the desire, and it's just, before you know it, it looks like a pizza. Well, if we're going to use that example. And it's not off the floor. It's a good one. So what does this look like then? What's our application? Pretty simple. There is a mystery of God's love. And by mystery, it's, it's something that's never fully understood, something that we'll never really be able to grasp, that we'll be able to hold on to. That's what makes it a mystery is you can't figure it out. So part of this mystery of God's love is this understanding of how deep it goes. John would say it this way, Jesus died for us, for humanity, for our sins, even when we didn't want it or deserve it. Mankind wasn't asking for this, but he did it anyway. Mankind didn't deserve it. You can find out next week with Cain. Mankind very quickly turns into murder. Mankind very quickly turns into um, control and power. And, and Cain, before you know it, you can trace Cain. Cain becomes Rome. Rome becomes the beast. The beast we find in, in Revelation. All of this thread moves right there where there is this anti-God, anti-love, anti-neighbor spirit that just moves right through human history and runs parallel to God's love. We didn't need it. We didn't deserve it. Even Paul in Romans says, even when we were enemies with God, that what? He sent his son to die for us. Secondly, Jesus knew, I think but probably this would be the hardest thing, is that not everyone would receive it. But it doesn't change it. He knew that a lot of people, if not the majority, would turn their back on him. But he does it anyway. You know, that, that statement, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. I don't know any human alive that could make that statement after having been beaten, ridiculed, mocked, spit on, stripped naked, and crucified. There are those that will look at what Jesus has done and say, it's amazing, but that's not what I want for my life. I can do this on my own. And you know what? As long as I'm better than most of the people I hang out with, this is all going to be, and it's going to work out at the end. And not only will I get that, I'm going to get this as well. Kind of our modern culture. And so John wants those on the outside to know that's never going to go well for you. But he wants those on the inside to know, look, this isn't always going to be the easiest journey in the world either. But part of this thing called life, full life, it involves suffering as much as it involves joy. There's some poverty as well as there's some wealth. There's some sickness as well as there is some health. There is some confusion and chaos as well as there is some peace. All of this comes together why? Because God has given his consent for this world to operate according to its own rules. Even though he's the one who set that in motion and controls it ultimately, he'll still give consent to it, even in the laws of nature. I would not say that God is angry with the people at Hawaii. There are certain rules that operate. Could he have stopped? Absolutely, but he could, gives his consent to it. Could he have stopped a hurricane that ravaged us in the you know, last fall? Absolutely, but he gives his consent. Something that even Jesus said. Hey, do you think those, you know, the 18 people that died when the tower fell on them? Think it was God? Do you think it's because they were a sinner? No, it's just natural laws God could have but he elected not to. He walked saying there are times that God's control will overstep his consent and I will say no to death here. I'll say no to leprosy here. I'll say no to poverty here. 
I'll say no to the, I mean, constantly does that. He says, so there is a whole lot that goes with this. So the one thing that we finish that we need to ask ourselves is this. He says, look, here's the test. No one who is born of God practices sin. The question that he wants you to ask is this. Am I sinning less? Am I becoming a professional in my love of God and of others? Or am I becoming a professional and building my own kingdom? Where am I putting all of my attention? He says, when you answer that, if you look and go, you know what, I'm sinning a lot less than I did, he says, you're fine. Continue with that. Because God's power helps your desire to continue to grow. And before you know it, you are living just like Jesus, and you are imaging him into this world. Let's stand. Did it. Father, this morning, Lord, we thank you for this day, a day that you have made. Lord, we thank you for all of our moms in here today, and we pray that you would bless them as well in a very special way. And Lord, we thank you for the words that John has brought us this morning, reminders of just how wonderful this life in you really is. That it's a good life, it's a full life, it's a challenging life, but it's not the best because the best is still yet to come. So this morning, we're just asking that your power will meet our desire and our willingness to do your will will enable us to add all of what Peter had spoken about, thus purifying ourselves and looking and thinking and acting more like you, Jesus, each and every day in our careers, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our relationships, everywhere, so that this world who is on the outside can have the light turned up just a little bit more that would enable them to cross over into the inside. So Father, as we go this morning, may you bless us and may you keep us. May you cause your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May your spirit continue to fill us. May your power impact us. And may our week be a great week no matter what it brings to the praise and glory of you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.